At only 22, Larry Page made history by laying the foundations for Google, the groundbreaking search engine that revolutionized our experience of the internet. In a matter of years, he and his partner, Sergey Brin, took their fledgling business to the forefront of an industry that nobody even knew existed. And decades later, Google's now become an industry behemoth, right up there with Microsoft and Apple. Yet, as time went on, something changed. Larry began to feel more and more isolated from the company that was once his source of pride. His ambition and prowess had propelled him from a humble background to one of the most affluent people on the planet, but at a dire cost. His formerly bold approach to problem solving and desire to serve the human race were ultimately replaced by apathy towards what he'd created. This is Larry Page's story, a tale of triumph, disappointment, and transformation. On March the 26th, 1973, Lawrence Edward Page was ushered into this world in Lansing, Michigan. His father held a prestigious position as a professor in computer science at Michigan State University, and his mother taught computer programming at Lyman Briggs College, also situated within the same university. Growing up, his abode was always a disarray of computers, technology magazines, and popular science publications left behind by his parents, all of which harbored creativity and invention within. He spent countless hours engrossed in these books and periodicals, an environment which, intentionally or not, cultivated his ever-growing sense of curiosity as a child. Then one day, Page was captivated by one of his parents' very first personal computers. From the very first glance, he was spellbound by the fascinating device, eager to explore its many functions and applications. After that, his affection for computers was evident for all to see. At only six years old, he found himself entranced by the numerous electronics that lay scattered around his home. Intrigued to explore what they could do, he'd sometimes take them apart to find out how they worked before effortlessly putting them back together. Page was also keen on playing multiple instruments. He credits his passion for speed and computing to music, stating, if you're a percussionist, you hit something. It's going to happen in milliseconds, fractions of a second. When Page was only 12 years old, he read a biography of the brilliant Nikola Tesla, the ingenious mind that brought many applicable uses to electricity. Page was shocked when he learned that Tesla was unfortunately overshadowed by Thomas Edison, and later passed away without ever receiving the accolades that were due to him for his groundbreaking work. Sadly, despite his brilliance, it would seem Tesla could not translate any of his inventions into commercial success and struggled to even fund himself. This brought young Page to terms with one crucial concept. It's not enough to simply bring useful inventions into the world, because if you don't find a way to promote your product, it'll sooner or later fade into obscurity. In order for real change to be made, one must not only possess intelligence, but also sound knowledge out of the business world in order to reach out to people in need. Larry went to a Montessori school, and this educational approach encouraged him to take initiative and apply his creativity in ways that piqued his curiosity. Through this, he learned how to work with people from various ages and backgrounds, providing a platform for knowledge sharing and learning among each other. After a successful high school career, Larry was excited to take the next step in his educational journey. He chose Michigan University, coincidentally the same college where both of his parents were employed, intending to major in computer engineering. During his tenure at the University of Michigan, he had ample time to apply and hone his exceptional problem-solving skills and boundless creativity. One such example was when he reverse-engineered an inkjet cartridge and constructed its associated mechanics using Lego, yes, actually Lego, in order to create a line plotter that could produce large posters for a fraction of the normal cost. Displaying a high level of exceptional talent at such an early age is already impressive enough on its own, but it was Larry's next pet project that would unintentionally become his magnum opus. Because when Larry decided to obtain a master's degree in computer science from Stanford University, it set him on an entirely new path, one which profoundly shaped his life and the lives of countless people around the world. This decision ultimately led to the Google we know today being founded. In 1995, Larry ended up on a tour group 
one where new would-be Stanford attendees were accompanied by a senior student as they roamed around the campus and contemplated whether or not to attend. It was within this group that Larry met up with Sajay Brian, a fellow Stanford student from the Computer Science Department. Friendly and helpful by nature, Brin's responsibilities included guiding fresh recruits around the campus and giving tours of San Francisco. After meeting him, Larry immediately warmed up to Sergey's personality and enthusiasm. Despite sharing immense mental acuity and inventiveness, Larry and Sergey were worlds apart in terms of personality. Larry was notoriously reclusive, uncomfortable around people, and would jump at any given chance to bail out of a conversation. In contrast, Sergey was an incredibly magnetic person. He more or less enjoyed discussing his interests with all who would listen, and displayed a particular gift for cogency. As their friendship grew, a fiery rivalry between the two also developed. They both appreciated each other's intelligence and often debated fiercely to demonstrate which one of them had the more compelling idea. While they sometimes spoke harshly toward one another in the heat of arguing, over time an intense bond blossomed between them, one that no amount of friendly competition or intellectual disputes could break apart. One day, Larry was on the lookout for an intriguing topic for his doctoral thesis. After hopping back and forth between many different ideas, he found himself most drawn to one particular subject, the World Wide Web. More specifically, Larry wanted to investigate the mathematical nature of the internet and organize all the chaos into one colossal graph. He presented this idea to his supervisor, Terry Winograd. Keep in mind, the internet was by far the most expansive graph humanity had ever crafted, and its growth rate exceeded every expectation. Countless invaluable insights lay hidden in its nodes, awaiting the right person to uncover them. Winograd welcomed the prospect of this right person being paged with great enthusiasm and encouraged the young man to go for it, advice that was the best he'd ever gotten, according to Larry. During this time period, search results on the internet often missed the mark. You'd search for a type of camera and end up with a mishmash of random web results with the word camera, maybe tucked away somewhere. This inspired Larry to develop a method that based rankings on the number of linked pages. In simple terms, he wanted to create a search engine that ranked pages based on relevance, so to speak. Nevertheless, Larry didn't have all the experience to make this happen on his own. So, he enlisted Sergey's help in executing the project due to the latter's basic understanding of HTML programming and knowledge of data mining, which could be defined as uncovering hidden patterns by sifting through vast amounts of data. Their project was nicknamed Backrub, named for its analysis of the web's backlinks. Page and Sergey used Page's dorm room as a laboratory to put together a machine from parts of cheaper computers. Once assembled, they connected their search engine to Stanford's broadband network. While Larry and Sergey loaded Larry's room with the necessary equipment, Bryn's dormitory was transformed into a programming hub. This was where they tested the capabilities of their search engine designs on the web. The immense and rapid growth of their project got to a point where it almost caused Stanford's computing systems to shut down entirely. By the mid-1990s, Backrub was gaining widespread attention and had a daily count of over 10,000 searches. Larry and Sergey sought to make all information accessible and useful for the world, but it took a couple of years before their mission caught the attention of both investors and academia. To keep their business afloat in the meantime, the pair had to rely on borrowed money from relatives and acquaintances until a shrewd investor noticed their promise. That individual would turn out to be Andy Bechtoschleim, co-founder of Sun Microsystems, a renowned computer technology firm at the time. After that, Larry and Sergey knew without a doubt that all the puzzle pieces needed to kickstart their business were in place. By this time, modest student accommodation wasn't suitable anymore to fulfill their needs. For this reason, they invested in a new office, which was the garage of none other than Susan Wojcicki. Some of you may know Susan as the CEO of YouTube. Only one thing remained for Larry and Sergey to officially kickstart their business, incorporating it. Two weeks later, they did just that. They thought about renaming Backrub to something more catchy at one point. While brainstorming, they landed on the idea of christening their search engine Google, derived from Google, a mathematical expression for 10 to the power of 100. After officially becoming a business on September the 4th, 1998, Page appointed himself as Google's CEO, while Bryn was named co-founder and president. 
In February 1999, the startup had already begun to expand and outgrew the garage space. Google's HQ was moved into an office situated above a bicycle store located in Palo Alto. In the first half of the year, Google's widespread popularity ballooned exponentially and required more capital to support its expanding personal demands. This proved to be quite the dilemma for Larry and Sergey, who despite their success, were unable to turn their notoriety into real financial gain. The two set off in search of new investors with a single stipulation from Page. He and Bryn would maintain more than half of Google's voting stock, along with ultimate control over the company. Initially, they were laughed at by Silicon Valley's venture capitalists. Gradually, the amusement surrounding Google lessened as it began to take off. Soon enough, Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia Capital, two of Silicon Valley's most notable venture capital firms, agreed to Page's terms and poured in a total of $25 million into Google. However, the investors had a demand of their own, as an agreement for permitting Page and Brin to maintain majority control over Google, the investors requested that Page, who was 26 at the time, resign from his position as CEO and hire experienced guidance in management. Larry despised this notion. He believed that further assistance, apart from Sergey's, wasn't needed to effectively run Google. However, seeing how Google was in desperate need of more cash, he reluctantly agreed to the deal, only to go back on his word after making sure investors couldn't back out themselves. Larry's motives weren't narcissistic as some may claim. He believed that a change in leadership would ultimately result in restricting the creative freedom of Google's staff. You see, Larry championed a culture of creativity and exploration at Google, encouraging everyone to explore new ideas, no matter how crazy or nonsensical they may seem. Larry's philosophy was admirable. To create services that were both easy to use and useful, employees must be allowed to think outside the box in order to come up with new and innovative ideas. He essentially took a see-what-works approach, allowing teams to go wild with ideas, then expand on promising ones. Additionally, Page all but encouraged his employees to argue while discussing these ideas. His thought process was quite simple. Employees who fought tooth and nail amongst themselves not only churned out better ideas, but were often more beneficial to the overall growth of Google. Essentially, he wanted his employees to compete and argue amongst themselves, in the same fashion he and Sergey did back in Stanford. It was Larry's hands-off, no-holds-barred approach to leadership that helped Google grow and become the tech giant it is today. Larry's leadership style meant that Google never lost the nimble, experimental feel of a startup, even when it no longer was one. In 2001, things were running relatively smoothly for Google. Stock prices were on the up and up, investors couldn't be happier, and the company was racking up tens of millions. There was, however, one person who wasn't particularly pleased with the status quo, and that person was Larry himself. Larry frequently found himself in clashes with investors, particularly when it came to his methods of running the company. Numerous finances kept demanding a passing of Google's torch to someone else, believing that Google could reach even greater heights if someone with more business expertise, like Novell's CEO Eric Schmidt, assumed executive leadership. Moreover, Google had grown so big and so quickly, with over 400 employees that manually managing and overseeing every single employee wasn't an option anymore for Page and Sergey. This proved to be quite a nuisance for Larry in particular, who many described as being a control freak. As a result, managers were appointed to monitor the rapidly expanding engineering team at Google, much to Larry's dismay. Needless to say, Larry wasn't all too excited about this newly formed rift between him and his fellow workers. It didn't help at all that he felt like Google's project managers were swaying engineers from projects he was passionate about. For instance, his plan to digitally capture and make all world's books searchable on Google wasn't being actively pursued, something Page attributed to misdirection by the team leaders. His primary concern, however, was that he despised having engineers answer to managers who lacked technical know-how, and so in July 2001, he decided to take matters into his own hands. Larry fired all 130 of Google's managing personnel at once. Now all of Google's engineers would fall under the command of one person, Wayne Rosing, who was recently appointed Vice President of Engineering. He in turn reported directly to Larry. The announcement left the project managers in disbelief. Without warning, they had been unceremoniously dismissed before their peers. Outraged supervisors clamored for an explanation, and Page reluctantly obliged, 
he revealed that his disdain for non-engineer supervisors stemmed from their flawed performance. His words were delivered dispassionately, with the usual robotic monotone everyone came to expect from their antisocial boss. Many investors felt Larry made a mistake with the decision, as they were concerned that his model of leadership could lead to an exceedingly hierarchical structure and would negatively affect Google's bottom line. Larry remained confident in his move and brushed off all investor concerns. This reorganization may very well have been the downfall of Google. Despite some engineers achieving success in the new setup, many felt lost without constructive criticism. However, since no one was actively monitoring each employee's performance levels, carrying out appraisals became a challenge, resulting in nothing getting done and the model failing. Ultimately, Google was forced to begin hiring managers once again. Following this blunder, in August 2001, Larry had no choice but to relinquish his position as CEO and graciously pass the reins to Eric Schmidt. Unlike other corporate execs sent by Google's board of investors to lecture Page on running the company, Larry took a liking to Schmidt, primarily due to the fact that Eric himself was a programmer. Larry was still more than active in the company, assuming the president of products role, but had ultimately realized that he could be more beneficial to Google's growth if he took a back seat. Under the direction of Eric Schmidt, Google changed its strategy from constantly seeking to innovate to just sticking with what already worked – ads. The company pivoted to ad-driven revenue streams, something which Larry in particular felt great disdain towards, as he wanted Google to be about life-changing inventions, not pandering to soulless corporate entities whilst peddling their products. Understandably, while Google grew beyond his wildest dreams under Eric's leadership, Larry couldn't help but distance himself from it all in disgust. In Google's later years, he felt like he became nothing more than just another voice to weigh in on meetings. As his influence slowly faded out of Google, Larry's love for what Google truly stood for began to falter as well. His focus eventually shifted towards pursuing technology he was truly passionate about, opting to let Schmidt handle all the mundane aspects of running a multi-billion dollar ad company, while he focused on investing in projects that were riskier yet more exciting, like Google's driverless cars and self-flying drones. Larry also funded several cutting-edge technological breakthroughs from Calico, the Google-funded R&D outfit focused on overcoming aging, to Android, Google's mobile operating system, which Larry personally supervised and ultimately became yet another avenue from which Google could pump out more ads. In January 2011, something unexpected happened. Eric announced he would be stepping down and Page would become the new chief executive of Google. This was bizarre, as it coincided with an outstanding earnings report by Google, so seeing how Schmidt was making Google tons of money, the question is, why was he let go all of a sudden? The fact of the matter is, much of it is speculation, but some believe it was Larry's influence that led to this decision, and that Larry was simply frustrated with dealing with him. The reason for this theory is Eric's statement following the announcement, where he stated that Larry and Sergey wanted to speed up decision-making. Once again a CEO, Larry had a reinvigorated outlook on staff relationships as he introduced an uncompromising zero-tolerance policy for fighting in February 2013. This was markedly different from his former approach, where heated debates between himself and Bryn were used to demonstrate how great ideas were born. After a period away from being in charge, Larry had finally understood that achieving ambitious goals necessitated team unity and collaboration instead of contention. Furthermore, Larry had also initiated Project Kennedy, which was Google's first company-wide redesign effort in its history. Its intention was to assure that all of Google's products had harmonious visual appearance. Larry also made the wise decision to purchase Motorola Mobility for $12.5 billion, something which helped shield Android from legal disputes initiated by Apple down the line. It is clear to everybody that his leadership skills grew exponentially during his time away from the big seat. In 2015, Larry and Sergey announced they were restructuring Google and appointing Sundar Pichai as its new CEO. Larry then stepped down from the day-to-day -day responsibilities of running the company to become executive chairman of Alphabet, a holding company that was to become home to numerous other companies previously associated with Google, like Calico, Google Fiber, Waymo, and Google itself among its subsidiaries. Larry and Sergey chose the name Alphabet because it was symbolic of language, one of humanity's greatest inventions. 
Additionally, they enjoyed how it was a play on words with alphabet, alpha being an economic term meaning return on investment. News of this decision came as a surprise to some. Why on earth would Google divide itself into multiple entities, only for them to be overseen by one parent company? What sets the new arrangement apart from what we had before with just Google alone? Why go through all of this? The answer is fairly straightforward, to please investors. Larry and Sergey reasoned that this action would appease investors, and to a certain extent, they were right. Finances only ever cared about one thing when it came to Google, and that's ad revenue, which amounts to about 90% of Google's total revenue stream. In the grand scheme of things, investors couldn't care less about these other companies that weren't somehow involved in the ads business. Some investors were hesitant to purchase shares for fear of their uncertain prospects. Others grew wary about the many non-advertising, riskier businesses that Google had ventured into. This hindrance on share prices was primarily due to the fact that these businesses required significant costs in order to capitalize, rather than being revenue generators from the get-go. The intention was also to provide investors with a clearer understanding of Google's earnings reports. Think of it like a two birds with one stone type of deal for Google's dynamic duo. They, and by they I mostly mean Larry, got to continue running all these wacky, crazy experimental investments, or moonshots as Larry likes to call them, while Google's finances could sleep well, knowing that the company's most successful and lucrative business, advertising, wasn't going anywhere. After restructuring, Larry handed over all responsibilities for running the day-to-day -day operations of Google itself to Sundar Pichai, and he himself became the CEO of Alphabet Incorporated. After the Alphabet controversy died down, Page spent his time trying to reignite that ambitious spark of his by expanding Alphabet's repertoire of ambitious projects, helming a $600 million flying taxi startup called Kitty Hawk, which shut down, as well as a secretive urban development project called Sidewalk Labs, which unfortunately met a similar fate. By this point, Larry was forced to face facts. The Google that he envisioned was no longer there. It is replaced by a giant corporate entity with its hands in every pie. Maybe Larry, through Alphabet, was hoping to relive his glory days. But as he would later find out, it is too little, too late. This enterprise of his had taken on a life of its own. No longer could he dictate with utmost authority how he wanted things done without being bombarded by fierce resistance. He came to realize that his pride and joy, his child perhaps, no longer even needed him. And so, 21 years later, on December 4, 2019, Larry Page stepped down as CEO of Alphabet Incorporated and was replaced by Google CEO Sundar Pichai. This wasn't a shock to Google's own employees. Apparently, Larry had given up a long time ago, as he was rarely seen in his office building. And even when he was confronted by someone, he'd try and cut the conversation short, before hightailing as soon as possible. Larry's exit was insignificant in the grand scheme of things. There were plenty of people capable of running the company just as proficiently, and Google had strayed so far from its original vision that neither Larry nor it could identify with each other anymore. Apart from still remaining an Alphabet board member, controlling shareholder, and an employee, Larry Page mostly chooses to distance himself from the day-to-day -day business comings and goings at Google nowadays, opting instead to spend quality time around his family and friends. What does the future hold for Larry Page and Google? Will he ever return to the company he founded? Only time will tell.